Job chapter 12. I'm going to start at verse 13 where Job is making evident the sovereignty and the power of God. In Job chapter 12, verse 13, With him are wisdom and might. To him belong counsel and understanding. Behold, he tears down and it cannot be rebuilt. He imprisons a man and there can be no release. You know, it's wise to confirm that your plans align with God's plan. It's even wiser to confirm your plans from the plan of God. And if your plans are not aligned with God's plans, then they're going to be destroyed beyond repair. Nobody will be able to fix them. And you will be held by him, and you will be called to give account. Verse 15, Behold, he restrains the waters, and they dry up. He sends them out, and they inundate the earth. Climate change? Yes, there is climate change. God controls the atmospheric conditions. There are going to be some radical climate changes during Daniel's 70th week, and I suspect that uh, some of these things going into Daniel's 70th week are a, a precursor to some very horrible stuff that we won't be here for, because we're going to be gone, we're going to be, we'll have met the Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds of the air and be taken out of this world before Daniel's 70th week hits. Verse 16, With him are strength and sound wisdom. The misled and the misleader belong to him. Now the word of God is absolute truth. In John 17, verse 17, the Lord Jesus Christ prayed on behalf of his disciples, sanctify them through your truth. This is a prayer to the Father. Your word is truth. And God Almighty ultimately exposes what is truth and what is misinformation, what is disinformation, what is malinformation, and the motives behind the dissemination of all information. Matthew 12, verse 36, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. And the Lord's fact-checking is absolute. And it's too bad Christians don't use this source more often, the Word of God. Verse 17, He makes counselors walk barefoot and makes fools of judges. Matthew Poole, a uh, nonconformist Protestant, this was the 1600s, nonconformist Protestants were ones who uh, refused to kowtow to the Church of England. He wrote on this verse, The wise counselors or statesmen by whom the affairs of kings and kingdoms are ordered, he leadeth away as captives in triumph, being spoiled either of that wisdom by which uh, that wisdom which they had or seemed or pretended to have or of that power and dignity which they had enjoyed. Verse 18. He loosens the bond of kings and binds their loins with a girdle. Joseph Benson, he was late 1700s, early 1800s. 
He wrote this about verse 18. He looseth the bond of kings. He takes from them the power and authority wherewith they ruled their subjects, ruled them with rigor, perhaps tyrannized over and enslaved them. And he divests them of that majesty which he had stamped upon them and by which they kept their people in awe. This God can and often does take away from them and thereby free the people from their bonds, of which we have abundance of instances in the history of different nations. He girdeth their loins with a girdle. He reduces them to a mean and servile condition, which is thus expressed because servants used to gird them uh, to gird up their garments, which after the manner of those parts of the world were loose and long, that they might be fitter for attendance upon their masters. He not only disposes them from their thrones, but brings them into slavery. Verse 19. He makes the priests walk barefoot and overthrows the secure ones. Now the priests uh, are the mediator between God and man. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is our high priest. That's because there is one who actually can mediate between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Uh, but he makes priests walk barefoot, that is, he humiliates them, and overthrows the secure ones. Now, application, there are many high-profile uh, Bible teachers, and I use that term loosely, uh, but there are many who have security in the, in the worldly sense. There are many false ones who have been very powerful in the world, uh, like Say, and, and this is just uh, because he has been pulled out from my memory lately and into my uh, stream of consciousness, Kenneth Copeland. He's a false teacher. Uh, his doctrine is horrible, and I don't mind telling you that. He is uh, of the Word of Faith movement and a prosperity gospel proclaimer. And the, the man is, uh, uh, well, I, I won't call him names, but I'll say he's, his doctrine is way off the mark. And this name it and claim it stuff, now he's worth, I guess, uh, 760 million plus or minus so uh, he would tell you of course he, he applies the principles he teaches and that's how he got wealthy well I don't care how he got wealthy uh, he does not accurately handle the word of God and but to say some of these false teachers are financially secure that would be an understatement but they are accountable and divinely administered justice will come, and false teachers will be called into account. And if they're, if they're believers in Christ, they'll be in heaven. They'll be called into account uh, by the, be the Bema Seed, if not before, uh, and not before and the Bema Seed. But uh, they, will, they will answer. So uh, let them be rich. Doesn't matter to me. Uh, let them live long. Uh, that's that's God's plan. I'd like to see some of them live long enough to uh, repent of their false doctrine and uh, to start handling the word of God accurately. Verse 20. He deprives the trusted ones of speech and takes away the discernment of the elders. He pours contempt on nobles and loosens the belt of the strong. 
Here's something else from uh, Joseph Benson. Uh, I like to read some of these writers that were, you know, back from uh, earlier centuries. They, some of them had some very keen insight. Joseph Benson on this verse, he poureth contempt upon princes. That is, he makes them contemptible to their subjects and others and weakeneth the strength of the mighty. The word here rendered strength occurs also in Psalm 109, 109 verse 19, where it is translated girdle. The clause might here have been rendered, he looseth the girdle of the mighty, a phrase which signifies weakness, Isaiah 5 verse 27, as the girdling uh, of the girdle, the girding of the girdle denotes strength and power. Isaiah twenty two twenty one, Isaiah forty five five. Both these phrases are taken from the quality of their garments, which being loose and long disabled a man for walking or working, he discovereth deep things. That's how they wrote back then. He discovereth deep things out of darkness. That is the most secret and crafty counsels of princes, which are contrived and carried on in the dark. Verse 22, he reveals mysteries from the darkness and brings the deep darkness into light. Here's John Gill, uh, 1700s. The secret plots, counsels, and combinations of wicked men which, laid, which they lay deep and seek to hide from the Lord being formed in the dark, but he sees and knows them, discovers and confounds them, to which may be added all the wicked actions of men done in the dark, but cannot be hid from God, with whom the darkness and the light are both alike, and who sooner or later brings them to light even the hidden things of darkness and makes them manifest and makes manifest the counsels of the heart as he will do more especially at the day of judgment to which every secret thing will be brought verse 23 he makes the nations great then destroys them. He enlarges the nations, then leads them away. He deprives of intelligence the chiefs of the earth's people and makes them wander in a pathless waste. They grope in darkness with no light, and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. Albert Barnes, an American theologian and an abolitionist of the 1800s, wrote this on this verse. Their unstable and perplexed counsels are like the reelings of a drunken man. And so there you have it. I, I hope you can see this. This is where we are today on both a national and a global scale. Now, you may have noticed over the past couple of years, I no longer open our Bible studies uh, with a prayer for the leadership in our nation that they would be guided. And that's because for all practical purposes, we don't have any leadership anymore. And as far as guidance, I don't pray that the Lord uh, would guide those in Washington, those with power in Washington, because uh, they're not guidable. They, they will not be guidable until they're saved, and uh, many are not. On the whole, they are unguidable. Uh, those who are saved uh, need to come to understand at least uh, some of the absolutes of the Word of God and, and recognize that absolutes are absolutes. 
And so I don't pray that the Lord would guide these people. Uh, I pray that the gospel would get to these people uh, in, an, in an accurate rendition, and they would have the opportunity to believe, and I pray that many of them would be saved and then guided. And God has handed many of these people over to their own so their own destruction, their own downward spiral, spiral of evil, per Romans chapter 1. And of those who haven't, uh, there are many who are unsaved. I pray for them. I pray for them with intercession. I also pray with them for thanksgiving, as we're supposed to do, in First Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, and I pray for them with thanksgiving because so far we have avoided the persecution avoided by many, or the persecution endured by many believers in the world throughout church history. So I pray with thanksgiving for our leaders uh, because at least there is still some order and some protection from from looting and from violence in the nation. So I pray with thanksgiving, but I don't pray that God will guide them. I pray they'll be saved, and then I pray that God will guide them, and I pray God will guide anyone with spiritual sensibility. But I pray mostly for the believers in this nation, the everyday, ordinary believer in Christ. Because as uh, Bob Thiem used to say often, as goes the believer, so goes the nation. That's the most important thing to pray for regarding uh, anything salvageable in our nation. And that's the most uh, valuable thing, the most valuable asset we have right now is spiritual growth among everyday, ordinary, average believers in Christ, even when persecution comes. I pray with thanksgiving for those with authority and power in Washington, D.C., because they're candidates for the gospel. And how wonderful is that? It's when we have such a, a, a wonderful uh, role as ambassadors for Christ, how could we carry that out if, if everyone had received reconciliation from the word of reconciliation. So we have a job to do. We are to redeem the time, Colossians 4 verse 5, toward those who are not saved. If you're listening to this session by recording, then how are you saved? You're saved, if you're saved, only by grace. The good news is if you're not saved, you can be right now. Christ paid your penalty on the cross. He uh, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and is presently at the right hand of the Father. And through his work on the cross and his vindication by his resurrection, he has the authority to offer salvation and you can't help his plan along at all. You can't work your way. You can't buy your way. You can't uh, be religious enough to get your way. Christ paid your penalty. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. You can turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 22. What does all this have to do with the angelic conflict? Plenty, plenty if I get far enough to tie the rest of it together. If not, I'll tie it all together next week. But it's important information nevertheless. 
Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 23. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say to her, You are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in her midst, like a roaring like a roaring lion lion tearing the prey they have devoured lives they have taken treasure and precious things they have made many widows in the midst of her her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things they have made no distinction between the holy and the profane, and they have not taught the difference between the unclean and the clean, and they hide their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princes, that is, her rulers, within her are like wolves tearing the prey by shedding blood and destroying lives in order to get dishonest gain. Now, right now, our citizens are being attacked by our own rulers working with and through the media, and we're being attacked by big tech, we're being attacked by big pharma, and they're all in it together. Uh, it is conspiracy. And they attack us so, so that they can become wealthy and powerful. And human life means absolutely nothing to those who are attacking us. Absolutely nothing. Verse 28. Her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God, when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land have practiced oppression and committed robbery, and they have wronged the poor and needy and have oppressed the sojourner without justice. I searched for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land, so that I would not destroy it. But I found no one. The illustration in the, this verse is that of a wall with a gap or breach in it. The ancient cities were all protected by walls, and the, the protection of the city often depended on how how strong and durable the wall was. And they were, the, the walls surrounded the entire cities. And a large hole torn down uh, in a section of the wall would let enemies come in to destroy a city. And if there was a gap in the wall, the warriors in the city would be dispatched uh, to that location to hold the breach. And if the gap was unprotected, the city would fall to its plunders. And so verse 30 again, I search for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land so that I would not destroy it. But I found no one. Verse 31, thus I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their way I have brought upon their heads, declares the Lord. Now this is it. I, I've heard many sermons on this, but I'll say what all the preachers say about this. The Lord is looking for someone to stand in the gap. Well, that's true. He, they have that right whoever says it, he is. 
and it's up to the decisions of the individual believer whether uh, our nation falls like a, a house of cards or whether our nation experiences some kind of recovery before Daniel's 70th week. We're not going back to, to the way things were. Uh, I, I can't see that. I, I won't state that emphatically, but uh, uh, I think it's, you know, it'll be over soon, but we can, uh, we could, we could buy some time like Josiah did, uh, but it, it, and it doesn't take that many people. Uh, like like Gene just said at, at the conference, doesn't take that many. But it is up to individual believers. It's up to the decisions of the individual believer to not be conformed to this age and uh, the world system of this age, but to be transformed by the renewing of the mind, Romans 12. Uh, one and two. It's up to the individual to shine forth the word of God through our ministry or service of reconciliation, to shine forth the word of reconciliation, to intercede for uh, our nation and for the entire world and to learn and apply divine solutions, not human ones. It's up to the individual believer to do that. As goes the believer, so goes the nation. Proverbs chapter 25. What I meant is you can turn there. Proverbs chapter 25. This is a, a verse I've foc focused on for several sessions now, and it ties in very well with what we just read in Ezekiel chapter 22. Think of, of uh, the man standing in the gap, and not, not just a man, uh, uh, women, young Young person, uh, we can we can all choose to stand in the gap for our nation and for the the world. But it all comes down to standing in our own gap, and this verse explains it. How we protect our souls is a very important subject regarding Satan's appeal trial. We're going to approach the subject of how every believer in Christ is being prepared to testify and whether our testimony makes a, a negative or positive impact for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this all depends on how we think. Proverbs 25, verse 28. Like a city that is broken into without walls, is a man who has no control over his spirit. The spirit being uh, mental disposition. Uh, Brown Driver Briggs lexicon on this verse. Temper, especially anger, disposition of very kinds, various kinds. Another meaning. Uh, often accountable and uncontrollable impulse before we can be to and before we can be any help to our nation or to the world to the needy in the world uh, before we can be any help to anyone before we can stand in the greater gap and help our nation, be of, of help to our nation or the world, we need to stand in our own gap, in the gap of our own city walls. This is the perfect illustration. Like a city that is broken into and without walls, 
is a man who has no control over his spirit. We need to we need to protect ourselves from our own walls before we can stand in the gap for the Lord and be of value to the human race. Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel 14, starting at verse 12. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, if a country sins against me by committing unfaithfulness, and I stretch out my hand against it, destroy its supply of bread, send famine against it, and cut off from it both man and beast, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst, by their own righteousness they could only deliver themselves, declares the Lord. Now, uh, Noah, Daniel, and Job were uh, examples of three men from three different times three great servants of God from three different times. And in fact, Daniel was a contemporary of Ezekiel. So the people of Ezekiel's day knew who Daniel was. And this destroying the supply of, of bread, sending famine, cutting uh, off from it both man and beast. Agricultural failure and famine result from failure of God's people in a nation or in nations, plural. And in, in the United States, it's beginning. We can already see less food on the supermarket shelves. Uh, we can all see the move toward fake meat. Oh, it's healthier. Uh, the experts have decided, so uh, let's go here and uh, in after all, Americans have had things too good. It's the guilt trip. You know, we've got to punish ourselves. The, the guilt trip for prosperity in this nation, which has been gained by following biblical principles. We do not have to apologize for that. We should enjoy that and thank God for it and keep operating in the principles whereby we have been blessed. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in the land, the impact of their imparted righteousness would not deliver the nation as a whole. It would only deliver themselves. Now, this does not nullify the principle of blessing by association, which I've, I've taught for many, many years, Genesis 39, 1 through 5, uh, and so forth. In fact, it supports it. But what this passage is saying, if it gets to a point where even a small number of people in whom the righteousness of God is upheld and expressed, if there, if, if there are too few people, then the nation will not survive. Their righteousness, their righteousness will not preserve the nation. How many does it take? God only knows. It, it, God only knows. And, it, you know, it differs as to what got down to, to 10 when, uh, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, when uh, Abraham interceded. God only knows. But... And this is this is speaking of imparted righteousness, not imputed righteousness. This is the righteousness of God actually working in and through a believer. But the point is that 
What we need is a core of believers faithful to God's word. And when that happens, it, when the world falls apart, at least we will be a believing community uh, that expresses life and love to one another. The life and love of Christ and the peace of God in Christ. And God has a focused plan toward the faithful, uh, however small their number may be. Individual responsibility is always the issue. And intercessory prayer is very important, but it only goes so far. Charles Spurgeon said, the prayers of the greatest intercessors cannot avail if men persist in their unbelief. Verse 15. If I were to cause the if I were to cause wild beasts to pass through the land and they depopulated it and it became desolate so that no one would pass through it because of the beasts though these three men were in its midst as I live, declares the Lord God, they could not deliver either their sons or their daughters. They alone would be delivered, but the country would be desolate. So this was a, a hypothetical situation, but it was the word of God addressed to Ezekiel and commanded to be spoken through Ezekiel. When the, Ka when the Chaldeans depopulated the southern kingdom of Judah it gave uh, open territory to the wild animals in the wilderness and in the forests and and this is what happens in depopulation wild beasts uh, when when cities and towns are destroyed wild beasts feel free to just move in and make life dangerous for everybody for for those who remain very hard to envision, uh, not as hard anymore because we've seen a, a little bit of it, but uh, very hard to envision in our own land now. Verse, we'll hold it right there uh, because it is 2.30 and we'll come back to this next week. Let us.